Hey there! Welcome to episode 2 of Academy of Anything. I know there was a bit of a delay for this one, but I took a bit of time off to celebrate a bunch of exciting changes. I got a new job, I get to spend more time with the pets in my life, and I'll be honest, I took like a whole week just for my birthday. But here we are again, and I am so excited to keep this journey going. The support and encouragement from you all has me really excited to keep on learning. This week, we're taking the Academy to space. And we have quite a distance to travel. Thousands of light years away, actually. So sit back, relax, and prepare for some mind-bending space knowledge. Twenty-six thousand light years away, in the heart of the Milky Way galaxy we call home, there sleeps a giant. An entity so captivating that billions of stars and planets swirl around it in awe. It is one of the most bewildering and scrutinized objects in our universe. A supermassive black hole. Now, the term supermassive almost sounds nonsensical at first, but what better to describe a sphere so gargantuan that it puts every object in our solar system to shame? Our sun, if hollow, could fit about 1.3 million Earth-sized planets in its volume. Sagittarius A-star, the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy, has a width of about 30 times that of our sun. But that jumbo-sized spectacle is just what we see, or rather don't see. The actual mass of that object and its gravitational pull are millions to billions of times that of our sun. Most of us picture a black hole as a featureless circle, eating anything and everything that comes near it. And while that's not entirely wrong, there is much more to the story, and even more to be written. So what exactly is a black hole? And what's inside it? Where do they come from? How do we study something we can't see? And why do we seem to find a supermassive one at the center of almost every galaxy? We don't know a lot about space's favorite mystery, but let's see what we can find out in this week's Academy of Anything. Even though black holes are our focus this week, we'll be learning a lot about other cosmic events, because like many things out there in space, black holes can be challenging to understand without knowing how different objects in the universe work. So we're going deep this week, dipping into physics, astronomy, mathematics, history, and many, many hypotheticals. Without further ado, let's power up those time machines because we have some work to do. As most years are, 1879 was a busy one. In the United States, Thomas Edison was working on incandescent lamp filaments for new light bulbs. Woodrow Wilson began studying law at the University of Virginia, and the National Archery Association established itself in Indiana, while the first artificial ice rink in North America was being put in at Madison Square Garden in New York City. And across the Atlantic in Scotland, 75 people lost their lives when the central spans of the newly built Tay Bridge collapsed into the Firth of Tay, resulting in the Tay Bridge disaster, which shook Victorian engineering to its core. And in Eastern Asia, the Qing Dynasty and the Russian Empire were intense negotiations for territorial superiority after years of conflict. But there was another event in 1879 that not only led to the eventual theorization of black holes, but also fundamentally changed the future of our world forever. It was the birth of a baby boy in Ulm, Germany. A boy who would turn out to be one of the most outstanding scientists of the 20th century, and likely all of human history. The boy's name? Albert Einstein. Born March 14, 1879, Einstein grew up in several regions throughout Europe in his early life. 
he first began schooling in Germany before moving to Italy, where his father operated his own business. After, Einstein moved to Switzerland, where he continued his education at the Swiss Federal Polytechnic Institute in Zurich. Later in Switzerland, he took a now famous position as a clerk at the Swiss Patent Office, where he worked until 1909. While at the Patent Office, Einstein developed his first groundbreaking articles and published some of the most famous works of his career, including his theory of special relativity and the well-known equation E equals mc squared, which describes the speed of light as a constant and defines a transitory relationship between mass and energy, which up until that point had not been considered fundamentally interchangeable. This was also when Einstein introduced the concept of space-time or the idea that space and time are not independent entities, but rather woven together throughout the universe. More on that in a bit. But the work that Einstein considered a masterpiece of his career would not be completed until 1915, when he introduced his general theory of relativity. This was the first significant new take on gravity since the description of Newton over two centuries earlier. You know, Newton's laws of motion we learned about in school, an apple falling out of a tree and all that. But it was Einstein's general theory of relativity that set the stage for modern physics, and interestingly, for the possibility of black holes. But to understand black holes and Einstein's part in them, we need to know how Einstein's general theory of relativity described the concept of gravity, since black holes are gravity on steroids. There are many visualizations required here, so bear with me. But this is how many organizations, including NASA, describe this modern concept of gravity to help those of us that are not astrophysicists. First, imagine a trampoline, just like the one that may be sitting in your backyard right now. Each trampoline has a flexible mesh stretched tightly across it like a sheet. This, for our purposes, is space-time the concept Einstein describes in that first special theory of relativity we mentioned earlier. Space-time can be challenging to wrap your head around, but think of it as a sheet where space and time exist together for now. Okay, now imagine taking a golf ball and rolling it across the trampoline just as it is. It should move in a relatively straight line from one end to the other and maybe even continue off the edge. But if you took a large, dense bowling ball and set it in the center of the trampoline, the shape of our stretched fabric would change. The bowling ball would push the center of the trampoline down with its weight and create a dimple in our space-time sheet. You can think of this bowling ball as our sun, sitting in the middle of our solar system and causing an impression in space-time. Now that there's a dip in the trampoline, imagine rolling the golf ball across it again. As the golf ball approaches the newly warped fabric, it will begin to fall in toward the bowling ball as it rolls around that dip in the trampoline mesh. This, in essence, is gravity, and that rolling golf ball could be a planet like Earth orbiting around our sun as it continues to come under the influence of the star's gravity. Now, this is a simplified explanation and is by no means an accurate representation of all the complexities in Einstein's work. Still, it helps us begin to visualize the concepts behind a black hole. But even then, our bowling ball example only begins to help us understand how the gravity of a black hole works, because black holes have masses that are millions to billions of times more than stars like our sun. So thinking about our trampoline scenario again, let's reset everything. We're back to a flat, tight sheet of material across the trampoline surface. Now, imagine you somehow have a little magic black marble. A marble so dense and so heavy that you can't even pick it up alone. If that marble were dropped on our trampoline, it would pull that material so far down that the center of the trampoline's mesh would be almost touching the ground, or even puncturing through it altogether. That's kind of the idea behind a black hole. Because black holes have such great mass and gravity that nothing can escape their pull. They bend the fabric of space-time so intensely that even light, the fastest known thing in our universe, cannot outrun their gravity. And deep down in that funnel of warped space-time, past the event horizon of the black hole, is theoretically a singularity, a point that is infinitely tiny and infinitely dense, and the source of all that gravity. 
but infinitely small and infinitely dense is just our fancy way of saying we have no idea what happens there. Heck, we don't even know what happens once we cross that event horizon. Carl Schwarzschild described the event horizon in 1916, just a year after Einstein's general theory of relativity was published when he discovered that there is a point at which gravitational collapse into the formation of a black hole is inevitable. According to a 2011 article by James Stein for PBS's NOVA, the Schwarzschild radius is the mathematical point of no return, where you'll get a black hole if a certain amount of mass is condensed into a particular area. For an object with as much mass as Earth to become a black hole, for example, it would have to squeeze into a sphere about the size of a golf ball. Yeah, the mass of our entire planet condensed into an object that could fit in the palm of our hand. That's the scale at which black holes form, so it's easy to see why studying these objects pushes us to our limits. Black holes are a mystery for us because our understanding of physics and mathematics kind of starts to break down in a black hole. The laws of our universe don't add up anymore, and we're no longer in an age where we can say, well, the physics is theoretical, so the answer must be something else besides a black hole. Those can't exist because we know for a fact that they are out there, swallowing worlds and ripping their neighbors apart. And until we can figure out just what happens in a black hole, we are missing fundamental knowledge of how our universe works. And if humanity ever plans on venturing out into the cosmos any further than we have, we may want to figure out how everything out there operates first, or at least get a better understanding. We have a long way to go before then when it comes to black holes, but think of how our outlooks on the universe may change once we figure out what happens in one. There are many theories out there, and eventually we'll find the one that fits. The primary trouble with studying black holes is obvious. We can't see them very well. To understand black holes better, we have to look at the objects around them, and oh, do their cosmic neighbors have something to say. Astronomers know that black holes are out there because they can see the effects that black holes have on their neighbors, aka stars and other objects in space that get just a little too close for their own good. In an August 2021 article for Live Science, Andrew May lays out some of the evidence we have for the existence of black holes. Gamma ray bursts, one of the first indications of a black hole, are pretty hard to miss. Mainly because, according to NASA, they are the brightest electromagnetic events known to occur in the universe, hundreds of times brighter than the supernovas that can arise in star death, and a million trillion times more luminous than our sun. A million trillion. Those are NASA's words, not mine. And according to Hubble Site, the NASA website for the famous Hubble telescope, a typical burst releases as much energy in a few seconds as the sun will in its entire 10 billion year lifetime. These high energy events can occur when stars collapse into black holes, which we'll also cover later. Another point of evidence May describes in his article is the gravitational pull we can see affecting star movement. In 2020, astronomers were studying a binary star system, just two stars orbiting each other, about a thousand light years away from Earth, which is just right down the block in space distances. The astronomers realized that the two stars behaved in a way that would only make sense if a third invisible object was influencing their orbit. They calculated the mass required to cause the anomalies they were seeing, and what do you know, it was about four times that of our sun, which meant that it had to be the new record holder for our nearest black hole. It's not always just these invisible forces we rely on for black hole evidence. In certain conditions, black holes can become some of the brightest objects in our universe. As different matter, like gas and dust, fall into a black hole, it can accelerate to speeds close to the speed of light and begin to get very hot and very bright. These accretion disks allow scientists to study how black holes pull material into the event horizon and provide evidence that something incredible is drawing in all that material. Another area of evidence described by May covers the impacts we see from supermassive black holes. Almost every major galaxy we look at appears to have a supermassive black hole in its center. Aside from the bright accretion disks from these behemoths, we also can see how chaotic of a region the inner galaxy can be. In our Milky Way galaxy, for instance, the stars at the center of our home spiral whiz around so fast they reach up to 8% of the speed of light. 
according to May. This means these stars are zooming around in the gravitational pull of an object that is both relatively small but highly massive. Even supermassive black holes have their size scale. So we know that black holes are out in our universe, but how exactly did they get there? Where do all these black holes come from? And what about those supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies like our Milky Way? How did they get so much bigger? Well, we know that most of the black holes in our universe form due to star death. Not every star death results in a black hole, but the largest ones typically do. Stellar black holes are the black holes that form when a star about three to five times the mass of our sun or larger begins to die. These stellar black holes are so common that there are likely millions or more of them in our Milky Way galaxy alone. And we believe that we understand the creation of these stellar black holes best of all. Our understanding of stellar black holes is in part based on our understanding of star life cycles. Stars like our sun spend most of their lives in a delicate balance of gravity and nuclear fusion. These giant balls of gas produce nuclear reactions in their cores where atoms, usually hydrogen atoms, collide and release a ton of energy, including heat, light, and other forms of radiation and energized particles. But at the same time these powerful reactions are occurring and pushing power out from the core, gravity is trying to pull it back in again. The stars we see in the night sky are usually in this state of equilibrium, where the force of their nuclear reactions and the power of gravity provide a relatively stable life for the star and allow it to send its light across the universe for billions of years. This starlight travels such large distances to reach us that when we look up into the night sky, we actually look back in time. Even the light we see from our own sun takes about eight minutes to reach us. So we see a version of the sun from eight minutes ago when we look at it, which we should never directly do, by the way. You sometimes hear that many of the stars in our night sky may have already died, and we're just now seeing the light that left them thousands or even millions of years ago which is kind of sad when you think about it. But don't worry too much, because that part is probably pretty exaggerated. According to Ethan Siegel, in a September 2020 article for Forbes, with our natural vision, we can only see stars that are thousands of light years away. Even though the light we see in the sky likely left the star a long time ago, thousands and even millions of years are like the blink of an eye in a star's life. So the chances are that the stars we're seeing are still happily burning away. But when a large star does approach the end of its life, whether destined to be a black hole or not, it can go out with a bang. A star typically begins to enter its last days when its hydrogen supply dwindles. According to Dr. Alastair Gunn in an article for the BBC's Science Focus, particularly massive stars quickly burn through their hydrogen supply. They can then move on to the fusion of other elements like helium and carbon. But eventually, the nuclear fusion in a star's core and the energy being produced aren't enough to offset the strength of its gravity, and the star collapses in on itself. During this collapse, the star can become a black hole as gravity takes complete control. But it's not all pure darkness when these black holes are born. In fact, star death can cause some of the universe's greatest fireworks. When stars collapse, they collapse incredibly quickly. Even stars millions of times the mass of our sun collapse in seconds, and with such force that they can cause a supernova, which as NASA puts it, is the largest explosion humans have ever witnessed. We're talking explosions so brilliant that they can outshine their entire galaxy. And I mean, we're talking galaxies with billions of stars in them here. And as rare as these events are, just a couple per century, some have been spectacular enough for humans to witness without the help of a telescope. In a November 2020 article for astronomy.com, Eric Betts explores the special supernova events that were visible throughout history. Chinese astronomers often referred to these events as guest stars, since they were only around for temporary periods and looked just as bright or even brighter than the stars they were used to seeing in the sky. One of the more conspicuous supernova events occurred in the year 1006 AD, which Betts describes as a, quote, strong contender for the best time to stargaze in human history, end quote. This supernova would have been 16 times brighter than Venus, which is typically only second to the moon in terms of brightness when we view the night sky. 
and this supernova was at specific points bright enough to be visible even during the day. We see this in historical records from China, Japan, Iraq, Egypt, Europe, and maybe even here in North America. People worldwide have seen these guest stars pop into view throughout history. And what many of them didn't know is that within that explosion, they could be witnessing the birth of a black hole right in front of them. But what about supermassive black hole formation? How did these behemoth dark wells come into being? Well, we're really not sure yet. NASA put it like this. Scientists think that supermassive black holes formed at the same time as the galaxies they are in. But there are still competing theories on their overall formation. What we do know is that not all supermassive black holes are the same. Even supermassive black holes have their own size scale, and it's in a whole other league. About 55 million light years from Earth, there is a supermassive black hole in the middle of the M87 galaxy that is over a thousand times larger than Sagittarius A star, which lies in the center of our Milky Way galaxy. Those famous black hole images that filled our phones and TV screens in 2019 and in May of this year were the result of scientists worldwide working to capture the data necessary to produce these stunning images. In a May 2022 article by Juan Siliazar for the Harvard Gazette, Michael Johnson and Don Pesci of the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics described their experiences achieving the monumental task of imaging not one, but two supermassive black holes. The image released in 2019 was the M87 black hole. Even though this supermassive black hole is 55 million light years away, it was easier to image than our own galaxy's black hole. This is because the material is being pulled into both black holes at the same speed. Think of it this way. Even though the material is moving around both black holes at the same speed, it has a lot more distance to cover on M87's black hole. Personally, I like to imagine that I'm looking down at the Earth and seeing two ships sailing at the same speed. One ship is sailing all the way around the world, and another is just circling Hawaii. I'm going to watch the boat around Hawaii make a ton of trips before the boat sailing around the world completes one. It's in this way that the matter and light swirling around Sagittarius A star is making many more revolutions in the same amount of time, which makes it pretty hard to get a good photo. And even though supermassive black holes have incredible mass, keep in mind that all the mass is condensed into a comparatively small area. So if the black hole resulting from a mass similar to our Earth could fit in our hand, then it's easy to see how difficult it can be to capture an image of supermassive black holes when they are so far away. Sagittarius A star, the black hole in the middle of our galaxy, like we said, is nearly 26,000 light years away from our solar system. Remember that if we could somehow fly at the speed of light, it would still take us almost 26,000 years to get there. And even though the mass of Sagittarius A star is millions of times that of our sun, it's only about 30 times wider than our sun. Remember when I said that it takes about eight minutes for the light of our sun to reach us? That means the sun is about 8.3 light minutes away, meaning that we could be at the sun a distance of about 93 million miles in about eight minutes if we could reach the speed of light. But even at that incredible speed, which comes out to about 186,000 miles per second, by the way, it would still take us nearly 26,000 years to get to the center of our galaxy. Which is why the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHD project, was so crucial for capturing these images of these behemoth black holes. The EHT project turned the entire Earth into a giant telescope by coordinating the actions of major telescopes around the globe. By acting together, these telescopes could see much farther into the cosmos than any telescope could have done by itself. The only way we can guess what happens inside a black hole is through math. And the math is something that's still being worked out. We often forget that math, physics, and other studies don't just magically hand us answers to the universe. Sure, we learn about equations, functions, laws, and theorems in school, but these weren't always just straightforward questions with defined solutions. We get nice, neat answers in school because, well, somebody already did the work for us. 
Most of us are introduced to these concepts long after people spend their entire lives figuring out how these things work. And that is probably why so many of us find black holes so interesting. We are learning more about them every day. And we have a pretty good feeling that whatever we learn from them will fundamentally change how we see the universe. Black holes capture our imaginations because imagination takes over when science reaches temporary limits. And that's really how it should be. Everything we know about the universe is based on science. And science must start somewhere. And that somewhere is usually an educated guess. Scientists are human fact finders, but they are also our dreamers. Their dreams get us to the answers of the future. Without them, we'd have a very difficult time explaining the world around us. And the world around us is vast. And learning about space can feel particularly overwhelming sometimes. Even this planet we call home is just a drop in the sea of everything out there. But I don't think that means we should ever feel small. We live on a planet powered by a star. A star that just so happens to be the perfect size and perfect distance away to make Earth inhabitable. Magnetic fields protect us from lethal particles. Our atmosphere doesn't suffocate us, and our water gifts an essential substance. We may seem small in the grand scheme of everything, but I think our luck outweighs all of that. We know everything we know about black holes because we've been lucky enough to be around this long. And I say, we make the most of it. Keep learning. Until next time, Austin. Hey, thanks for joining me this week. I hope you enjoyed our journey into the universe. Next week, join us for an exploration of ancient Greece. We're covering everything from the famous mythology to civilizations that shaped the world. And who knows where we'll go next time with Academy of Anything.